things are applied in the art that comes out of the Renaissance period. Here are the questions that you should be able to answer by the end of this video. Please make sure you can do so before you come to class tomorrow. So there's a reason that the Italian Renaissance is remembered more for its art and its culture than for any of its political developments. The reason for this is that within a hundred years of the beginning of the Renaissance, the Italian city-states find themselves in political decline. Italy remains politically divided throughout the Renaissance, with important city-states like Florence, Milan, and Venice, and also the papal states centered around Rome, fighting each other constantly for control of the Italian peninsula. This goes on until the end of the 1400s, when a number of invasions by both the French and the Spanish causes the Italian city-states to lose independence. They basically become pawns in a larger struggle between France and Spain. Uh, the reason that this happens is that the tiny city-states in Italy cannot compete with the huge centralized kingdoms of France and Spain. Uh, so even though the Italian city-states lose importance uh, pretty quickly in terms of their political significance, in terms of their artistic and cultural achievements, they remain extremely important for centuries to come. Uh, and that is because the ideas that originate in the Italian city-states spread out to the rest of Europe, and Italy remains an inspiration to these other European countries. The intellectual core of Renaissance culture is the movement known as humanism, which began to emerge as early as 1350, a period when most, most people would still consider Italy to be in the high Middle Ages. It was exemplified in early figures such as Petrarch and Boccaccio, and in my class you actually got to read a little bit of Boccaccio's description of the Black Death as it raged through Italy. Humanism comes with both a new worldview and new kinds of thinking. The new humanist worldview uh, is inspired by contact with ancient Roman and Greek writers. And their new ideas uh, center around the idea that human beings are good and noble creatures, which can be made even better through reason and learning. This leads them to the belief that reason rather than tradition should govern human affairs. Basically, they think that by learning about the world, human beings can make the world better. This is summed up in the words of one of the leading Italian humanists, uh, Leon Battista Alberti, who said in one of his works that man is born to be useful to man. Basically, that is that human beings should strive to be useful to society. Uh, and this was linked up to their last belief that learned men should be active in the world, not cooped up in monasteries like they frequently were in the Middle Ages. Uh, along with this worldview came new ways of thinking, and uh, this was linked mostly to the study of new subjects. The focus was now on history, poetry, mathematic, mathematics, natural science, and ancient languages and philosophy, rather than on theology, which was the main subject of the Middle Ages. Uh, not only did they study new things, but they applied these new things to social problems. And this was most famously done by a scholar who studied language in the case of the donation of Constantine. He was able to analyze an ancient uh, contract held by the Roman Catholic Church that entitled them to control a bunch of land in southern Italy. Uh, this scholar, whose name was Valla, was able to read the contract and conclude that it was a forgery and that the Roman Catholic Church actually had no legal claim to this certain chunk of land. This is an excellent example of the application of humanist learning to social issues. Uh, 
And finally, we see with humanism the spread of vernacular literature. And that means that the literature that was going around was in the language spoken by the common people, not in Latin. And this is really different from the medieval period because almost all writing was done in Latin, which the common people could not understand. Uh, since there's a shift to the vernacular language, this allows normal people to understand what is going on in books and encourages an increase in literacy. The thing that the Renaissance is most known for is its artistic uh, breakthroughs, but this art was actually very closely linked with the humanist movement. And in fact, all of the great artwork that comes out of the Renaissance would not have been possible if it were not for the application of uh, humanistic uh, subjects and studies to the problem of architecture and painting. And so what we're going to see are three examples, famous works of Renaissance art that actually relied on new scientific and mathematical advances, starting with Brunelleschi's Dome. So this is Brunelleschi's Dome, which even today is the tallest structure in the city of Florence. This building was uh, commissioned by the city of Florence in 1418. Basically, they wanted to have the coolest church of any city around. Uh, and they ended up hiring this guy, Brunelleschi, to build the dome. Brunelleschi, before he began, set out on a wide-ranging historical study of architectural styles. So rather than just building a Gothic cathedral like everybody was doing around that time period, Brunelleschi studied Roman, Persian, Byzantine, and Gothic architecture. And based on his studies of all of those different styles, he came up with his own new style. This style was based not only on his historical findings, but also on his careful application of mathematical and geometrical principles. And this allowed him to come up with an entirely new style of cathedral that you see there. It was extremely impressive. Nobody else could make a dome that big. And once he came up with this, this new style, it quickly spread throughout the rest of Europe and replaced Gothic architecture. Florence was extremely proud that they were the people who began this new style of church building. All right, so now we're going to look at painting and how it changed in the Renaissance. So here is a typical medieval painting. It's a religious subject, of course, um, and as you can see, it kind of has like a flat, almost cartoony quality. The people are all different sizes, which doesn't really make any sense. Like, you can see all these people are standing on the same plane, but some of, the, some of them are really tiny. You can also look at the architecture in the background, and something about it just seems a little bit wonky, as if it were in some sort of weird hall of mirrors. And this is because they did not, in the medieval era, understand the mathematical principles that underlay the, uh, I don't know, the, the way people see things. And this changes in the Renaissance. So here is a typical Renaissance painting. And as you can see here, it looks very, pretty much realistic. Like, except for the bright colors and some of the funny expressions on people's faces, this could almost be a picture. Uh, all, the people, all the people and all the lines make sense. This is possible because of the application of new mathematical and geometrical ideas to the art of painting. And the main breakthrough that they made here that allowed them to realistically render 3D images on a two-dimensional surface was linear perspective. And how this works is all the lines that appear on a certain place eventually converge at a single point somewhere in the painting. So you can see at the small image on the right that in this image, all of the lines eventually converge at the central point at the door of that uh, cupola, or whatever you want to call it. But so anyway, this was a well-known work commissioned by the Catholic Church, and this guy Perugino painted it. And the image shows Jesus Christ handing over the keys to heaven to Peter, who was believed to be the first pope of the Catholic Church. 
This image was used by the church to reinforce the basic Catholic idea that the church was the only true route to heaven. So we see the use of new um, mathematical ideas uh, to support uh, long-standing traditional messages. All right, and now we see uh, some typical medieval portraits. And you'll notice on all of them that the people look almost kind of cartoony. Uh, some of them don't even really look like a specific person. Like, you might not be able to recognize the particular person that's being painted. Uh, the main thing about each of them is not who they are, but what they are. You've got the Virgin Mary and Jesus over there on the left. You've got some queen in the middle and a king on the right. The focus is not so much on their individuality, but on their status, especially the kings and queens. This is typical of medieval portraiture. The social status is more important than the individual qualities. This totally changes during the Renaissance, and it changes primarily because of a shift towards a uh, greater emphasis on individual characteristics. But it's also made possible by advances in uh, painting and advances in our scientific understanding of what the human body actually looks like. And this is most perfectly exemplified in the work of Leonardo da Vinci. And so Leonardo da Vinci is world famous for his portraits. But the only reason his portraits are so perfect is because of his scientific understanding of the human body. And so if you see over there on the right, those are uh, pages from Leonardo da Vinci's notebook. And in his notebook, he did hundreds of studies of how the human body and especially how human muscles and bones worked. So when he was painting somebody, he didn't just paint what their face looked like, but he thought about how the muscles and the bone underneath the face would have supported the flesh. And so all of this allowed for him and for other painters that use similar techniques to capture the unique characteristics of an individual more clearly than any artist before. And so you see here a portrait of a wealthy, fancy lady with her pet ermine. Uh, I guess it's kind of like a ferrety creature. Um, but so she's not just anybody. She's a very specific individual, but you can also tell by how she's portrayed that she's a wealthy, elegant lady. This is important because wealthy individuals used art to depict themselves in particular ways. Let's, let's move back a little bit. Let's scoot back. So why, why is art so important in the Renaissance? Well, the reason that art is so incredibly important in this time period and also throughout history is that groups and individuals can use art to send messages to the rest of the world about who they are and what they stand for. And this makes art almost kind of like old school advertising. And how this works is that human beings understand the world around them in terms of the art and media that they see. And if you can control art, that means you can control the way people understand the world. And if you can control the way people understand the world, then you can more or less control them and how they behave. And so the reason that all these powerful groups like wealthy individuals and uh, cities like Florence and also the Catholic Church use art is because they're trying to uh, control the way people understand the world and understand them. For example, Brunelleschi's dome is used by the city of Florence to demonstrate its cultural and economic superiority to all of its rivals. Perugino's painting uh, is used by the church to spread the traditional message that the Catholic Church is the only route to salvation. And da Vinci's portraits were used by wealthy individuals to show the rest of the world that they were uh, important, wealthy people with class and taste. Art is a tool for controlling the way other people think about you and the world. So that's pretty much it for this slideshow, but uh, the Renaissance is so filled with amazing artists that I felt like I had to include a couple more pictures. So here is a famous sculptor, a sculpture by the sculptor Michelangelo. Uh, this is just one of his incredible works. 
take a moment and appreciate it. Here's an amazing picture by Raphael, one of the leading painters of the late Renaissance. This is called the School of Athens, and it depicts all of the famous philosophers and mathematicians of the ancient world in a single, almost like celestial, heavenly space, debating with each other about reality. And finally, here is the Birth of Venus by the painter Botticelli. And one thing that's interesting about this is that there it is an entirely non-religious, or at least non-Christian painting. So you see the emergence of uh, ancient Greek and Roman ideas and their competition with traditional Christian subject matter. It's also just an amazing painting. Anyway, that's all I've got for you today. Please take a moment to read over these questions, and um, I'll see you tomorrow.